Um, another distinguished panelist here today is Michael Kraft from Evcom. Michael, introduce yourself and your company. Thanks, Bill. My name is Michael Kraft. I'm the Managing Director at Avcom. And we build and sustain satellite ground stations in Australia and throughout the Asia Pacific region. Uh, more recently, we've pivoted to uh, manufacturing onshore in Australia with the announcement of our Cassowary series of satellite ground stations, primarily to serve uh, the Earth observation market supporting uh, the S and X frequency bands. Uh, previously, we've, we've worked with the Bureau of Meteorology on their uh, Himawari uh, weather satellite program, as well as the Feng Young uh, constellation uh, of satellites. But more broadly, our role is to promote the critical role the ground segment plays in the Australian space ecosystem and to champion the design of the ground segment in parallel with that of the spacecraft to assure that we have access to that mission critical data and it's delivered to the people when and when it's needed. Thank you, Michael. And of course, we know Odd from her wonderful presentation earlier. So do you want to say anything further, Odd, to introduce yourself now to the audience? Maybe a few words about me. Also, I've been attending this conference for almost 10 years now. Um, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have believed I would have been here announcing that the government is investing 1.2 billion in procurement to do a space mission. So for me, it's a dream come true and it's, it's just the beginning. So that's all I wanted to add. I think that's apropos. Um, Odd's um, son and my son went to the same high school and we used to meet and commiserate <laughs> for coffee after drop-off at times about the state of the Australian space industry about 10, 15 years ago. So now it's, uh, it's fantastic to see that it's uh, in a very different place, a very positive place, and it's great to see that you're a big part of it. So, welcome. Congratulations. At this end of the, of the panel, we have Matt Dawson. Matt, you introduced yourself earlier, but you'd like to say a few words now to reintroduce yourself to the group, and then we'll, we'll, play, we'll go to Jason's. Uh, oh, you yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, I guess uh, for those of you that uh, saw my presentation uh, just before lunch, should by now have a pretty good idea of what um, TALUS Australia is um, doing in uh, the business of space, so I have um, that business for TALUS Australia New Zealand. Uh, and that included, of course, um, you know, the uh, collaboration projects that we're doing uh, with a number of universities and other collaboration institutions to really try and create a unique Australian capability that not just satisfies Australia's needs, but also uh, has export potential for, for broader markets. Yeah, so I think that's probably about it. And I don't want to say from the outset that I'm not um, an Earth observation expert <laughs> by any means. <laughs> I feel like an imposter. You're a general here. expert. I'm an imposter up here on, on stage amongst these, uh, these experts. But, but that's one of the beauties of the space industry. It actually brings to, together experts from many different fields to put together a project. And so, um, so a lot of experience is needed with all of these things. So could we um, go to the uh, event that um, uh, Matt had arranged for us from Talis today, which is the, the talk um, from Jacob Markham, who is unfortunately holed up in his hotel room, convalescing from COVID. Okay, so clearly, um, Matt, we might just chat with you for a second about that, given that um, you, Jacob was coming out to uh, talk at the conference and some other things here. How big a role is um, Earth Observation playing in uh, defence thinking in terms of your talks of defence? Well, it, <clears throat> as you can see, um, Jacob's focus there was on the um, you know, application of, um, well, defence applications for Earth observation, I guess, which is going to be quite different, I, I imagine, to mm. some of the um, other panellists' discussion. Um, but I think um, uh, what I've been talking to J Jacob about is that, you know, these new and emerging threats like the hypersonic um, situation that he was talking about, they're really driving some, some urgency, I guess, in, in, uh, in, in realising now that in any region, um, it, you know, our, our most immediate threat could be right now on the other side of the planet and, um, and not that many minutes away from, from being that threat. And we don't really um, have a lot of solutions to that problem. Um, and so um, that's why, of course, there's, there's some um, momentum behind um, capabilities that Black Sky and, and others in the US obviously have, have, um, have started to focus on. 
So and I think obviously um, in Australia it'll be it, you know we need to think about those sorts of things as well. Um, it'll be it'll be fantastic to, to have some sort of sovereign capability. Um, I'm not sure um, that that's immediately what the um, the, the mission that um, orders outlined is for, but um, it certainly starts to give us that sort of capability. We're always I think um, you know um, it's important to always collaborate and, and not. Not to be totally reliant on, but certainly um, uh, collaborate with with our partners to, to make sure we have the best eyes on what we need to have eyes on, I guess. And that, that was, I think, one of other one of Jacob's other main points there. Yeah, that's um, that's really useful. I mean, what's what's really interesting? The current world we're in, we are seeing Earth observation images on a, almost a nightly basis on the news these days. Um, it's brought that imagery into a, a very, very different kind of context. I mean, Aud, would you like to comment on, to the extent that you can, um, discussions that you've had with the agency and defense on an Earth observation program? We'll get to the national mission in a moment, but um, anything you can offer on the thinking that may have changed in you know the last year or so around Earth observation, the importance of it? I don't think there has been a change uh, when we do when we did our space strategy in 2019. When you look at the seven areas of priority, you have a, a defense project attached to each of them. So we really did that together. Uh, we are a, a nation small enough so we can we can do things together to deliver differently. Every area of priority is also observation. We're looking for monitoring. Defense is looking at surveilling. As I say, we're looking for hazards, they're looking for threats, but at the end of the day, the capability you need is the same, the sensors mm -hmm. you need is the same, the, the revisiting time is the same, it's the application you do from this data and these sensors that, uh, that, that differs. Um, so that there is no, there's not been much change since the last year, uh, since the beginning, and you can see in all these roadmaps, we acknowledge a technical advisory group at the end of all this roadmap, this technical advisory group are usually 15, 20 experts that we found in, uh, in Australia. No industry, because we want to make sure we are agnostic. Um, but there is the whole of governments participating, industry associations are, are there, SIA is there, universities are there, and defense is always there. So um, we are consulting with, with industry. We want to make sure that this roadmap makes sense. If you guys tell us this is rubbish, we go back to the, the, the drawing board. Um, but we are really looking into um, Developing capability, I think we are we are pushing defenses pulling, and we have this small snowball effect, and uh, reaching a point where when we have a need and application, at the end of the day, it's always what's the user end, what's the end user needs. Uh, you don't do space for the sake of space. You do space to deliver a specific needs, and and every mission starts from there. What is it that we need? What is it mm. that we want to uh, to deliver? Um, so we're working very hand in hand uh, with defense on on everything we do. And Michael, do you have um, any, you know, obviously the ground system side of it is such a, a crucial component. Are you having discussions with Defence about that side of things from an Earth observation perspective at this stage, or is that a little bit early in the piece? Probably a little bit early in the piece for us, but I think the Defence use cases are fairly well known. But from my perspective, what I'd like to see is the conversation broaden to bring in you know, the commercial applications of Earth observation data. If the Australian space industry and, and the companies operating in it are going to be sustainable, we need to broaden the value. We need to use that data in different ways. There's no, no doubt of the value that it provides the defence, but how can we use that data uh, to extract other value? You know, other companies can come along and, and use it to come up with creative solutions. And, and you know, we're not even sure really where it will go yet, but if we can, give the data out there, people will find clever ways to use it, clever value to extract from it. And, and I think that's the, that's the end goal for sustainability in the Australian space ecosystem. From, certainly from an SME's perspective. Yeah. Um, Alex, did you want to comment on the, uh, I suppose that security defense component of EA, which was more this theme at the moment. We'll, we're going to get back into the, uh, the space mission here in a second, but uh... I, I was just going to follow up on the on the ground segment side of things, but because I think I mean it was said before, the the biggest chunk of this 
the, the growth in the space industry and the Earth Observation side is on the downstream value adding side of things. And um, at the same time, the big challenge for that industry is not only accessing the data, but making sure that the data that they can procure either commercially or from public good satellites is well calibrated, is up to global standards, and it's organized in a way that they can quickly use it. And now, um, for Australia at least, from the Landsat program, we have about almost five petabytes of 40-year satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. People want to use that the whole time series for climate change work. So it's a lot of effort, but Australia's become really, really good at managing those big data sets, organizing them, and then allowing industry to come in and value add it and use it for a variety of applications. I think that's the same thinking with the new satellites that we will build um, under the, the new space program. A lot of that data will be contributed to those archives. So um, I think that part of the ground segment is just as critical for our industry. Make sure it's easy to use, they can access it, and it's calibrated to world standards so they can be competitive internationally as well. Can I expand on, on what you said that we even don't know the application of tomorrow in EO? I mean, when we did the GPS, who would have thought all the application we get from this? I think EO is going to be the same. We're going to have a, a GPS revolution on EO. Uh, similarly, I mean, the sound data that CSR is playing with, uh, you, you can see during the bushfire, it helps looking at the burn scar mm -hmm. the, and where to stand the regrow yeah. and that, the forest, but that, that's new. Uh, in Italy, when there was this big um, bridge collapsing, they're using sound data to see okay, which building needs to have uh, remediation work. So it's the tip of the iceberg. I think we have a huge EO revolution that no one here has any idea of that's what's coming. Exactly. Um, well put. So I'd like to shift the conversation to, to on, you talked about um, that phrase you love to say, and I, that really, really resonates with me. Could you say it again about what is it that we're actually doing? It's the first ever national <laughs> space mission for Australia. That is fantastic. So can we talk a little bit more about that? Um, so one of the things that's in my mind, um, we've had a change of government. Has the new government endorsed this as well, or is it uh, was this already approved in official policy um, through the process? Or what can you tell us about that? At this Thank point? you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we haven't had a big debrief yet with the new government. Um, to date, there is no indication that they're going to change anything. Um, space sustainability, cl climate change is high on their agenda, so we don't expect any change. But we, we'll have to have this conversation. So I still think the phrase stands, and we should stick with that. But could we move then to the rationale behind it? Some of the, clearly the roadmap probably played a role, but can you talk a little bit about how the, it's going to be a hyperspectral series of instruments, is that correct? So and, the, yep. there was what an opportunity, in fact, so yes, the roadmap, it's, it's this cycle. We did the strategy, roadmap, mission. Every, every roadmap contains a lot of potential for, for mission, and this, this is one, and we are, we are brainstorming more to come. National mission delivers three things. One, they deliver on, on um, the government goals. Again, why do we need EU data? We need EU data for our day-to-day -day, uh, lives. And for EU, it's easy. We've been a consumer for 40 years. It's time to bring something back uh, to, to the community. No brainer there. It happened that this cross calibration mission was an opportunity with, with NASA. They were looking for uh, making sure that we could calibrate different space mission, land imaging missions. So these are small satellites that we could do because we are starting not from scratch, but we are, we are starting from um, not the metro position. So they are, they are a good size for us to have a, a go at, at starting somewhere. And, and we won't do it alone. NASA and USGS is gonna help mentoring us and, and they're gonna be, the first one is gonna be small and the next one we're gonna be bigger and, and they're gonna have more um, sensors for our own use. 
Um, if we are thinking of uh, fuel load, for example, uh, our fuel load is eucalyptus data. They are not pine trees, or they are not. They are different from other trees. So we need our own sensors uh, to to solve our own problems. So as we go along, these satellites will get a bit bigger, um, and ideally, we'd like to launch two every two years um, for, uh, until 2040s and, and, and even further. That's the main missions. There is another work stream that we call those venture, and we will go into details in, in, in due time, but that other stream is there to accelerate the TRL uplift, so we, we want to take all this text that is around TRL 3, 4, and accelerate that to 9. When it's operational, we put them in the, in the big operational mission. We want to do a decadal plan in EO, and we want to do some educational program, we want to do a lot of things. I think we had time through the EO uh, roadmap, but all the other roadmap, because it starts with EO, but you know, once you have a, a bird there, you can stick another sensor for PNT, for comms, for, uh, for all the roadmaps we are developing. But we had time when we, we did this uh, state-of-the-art exercise, when we talked with you guys, the industry, we had time to think about what is it that we need in this country to accelerate um, our, our capability growth. So we tried to design a program that's going to answer all this. And we heard you that grants, there is so much you can do. Um, procurement, long-term investment is what the industry is needing. So I think we heard you all. And, and this is the first uh, mission that we are doing, and, and hopefully not the last. That's fantastic. Uh, how did you decide on the sensors? Uh, you know, hyperspectral versus radar versus, I mean, at some level, um, that instrument package is the key component to that. How did you feel the hyperspectral fit, fit best within the capability of Australia and the, um, the needs, the Earth observation needs that um, are coming through? So, several answers to that question. Again, what's the user needs? Mm. And the user need here is to cross-calibrate hyperspectral satellites. So no brainer, yeah. we need to develop hyperspectral. And hyperspectral is, is really where we want where, yeah. where we want to go. Uh, but you know, SAR is solving other problems. Optical is solving other problems. So what is the problem you want to solve and then develop the, the, the sensors? This mission is a cross-calibration in, in, in hyperspectral. So this is what we're doing. Right. And Alex, do you have... Um uh, has CSIRO played a role in those discussions and, and what, what did CSIRO bring to the table in terms of the, the development of this mission and the uh, capabilities within CSIRO at this stage to, uh, to assist in that? We were part of the, the technical advisory group that developed the, the roadmap, for instance, um, and since then we've been uh, just working with the space agency and GA and the Bureau on framing the what that first part of the investment might look like. And that comes back to, I think you remember a satellite we were proposing almost 20 years ago I to do. Aries. <laughs> I do. <laughs> which was fantastic, was going to be the first yep. pretty much operational hyperspectral satellite for the mineral industry primarily. Yep. Never got the funding to do that. But So there's quite a bit of history in, in CSR mm -hmm. on the hyperspectral applications started with, with mineral mapping and exploration, but now it's been used for environmental applications, water quality, and lots of other applications. So um, that's one of the things we, we, we bring. And we also bring a very strong um, history and heritage of satellite calibration with investment into infrastructure on the ground, with calibration sites, with radiometers and, and things like that that we use to just test how the atmospheric correction, how well it's being done from hyperspectral or, or optical satellites, or uh, with corner reflectors um, that look at the signal from um, synthetic aperture radar satellites. So that's the sort of, I think, heritage we bring into a mission like this. So uh, this is this, this data assurance and integrity monitoring for two mm. segment that Alex is talking about. So sensors everywhere on the ground in Australia that CSRO and GM are, are operating and pro providing this certificate, you're calibrated yep. with sensor on the ground, that's unique. I, I, yeah, Australia is one of the best place, places in the world to be able to do that and it's such a critical part of all of the uh, Earth observation missions. Probably not as sexy as launching things into space but it just gives us the quality uh, and the new companies can come and use the data for free 
uh, to help uh, check their satellites and, and see how they're performing over time. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's all about finding our niche. Where is yeah. the niche for Australia to succeed and shine? Um, and with this mission, I think we move from the kids' table to the, to the adults' tables, and the conversation we're having with other space agencies has really changed. So it's, uh, it, it's all about bartering as well in this world. Yeah. So uh, what Alex is describing is, is actually the kind of conversation we're having now. Absolutely. I mean, I remember a lot of the discussions around the IRIES uh, program, the hyperspectral uh, sensors it was going to have, which was almost world leading at the time, had it gotten up. What capability do we have? Do we still retain that expertise in hyperspectral to be able to put onto our own satellites, or does that need to be built a little bit from the ground up at this stage? I mean, we have companies like High Vista Corporation here based in Sydney that still has that capability and that expertise in hyperspectral imaging, which they're currently using on aircraft uh, sensors, but that can eventually also go into space. Um, and we have smaller chunks, uh, clusters of optical uh, sensor design experts in Adelaide, for instance, and in other parts of the country. So it, it's maybe been dispersed a little bit, and some of us have, may have retired, but bringing that expertise together shouldn't be a big if, issue now that we have a real, real program. Mm. That, which will be hyperspectral to bring a lot of those people together again. You know, it's amazing how many retired space people come out of retirement when there's an interesting project to get on the go. But, you know, it's, it's also building new capability. Again, all these roadmaps, it's because there is a market. Mm. We have seen a market for Australia and the world in this area. So it's, when, when I said we invite the industry to, to embrace this, these pathways, it's, it's because we've done our homework and we will be an anchor customers and they're, they're going to be other industries and, and um, agencies that will be uh, customers. So um, if there is no capability in, in hyperspectral, we need to build it without a doubt. Yeah. Absolutely. Bill, am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah, I was going to flick, <laughs> flick you up. I, no, I, just, I think it's a fascinating discussion. I'd be really interested to hear, um, you know, what Alex and Michael imagined will be sort of like the, the killer app for the first mission and what uh, ec economic benefit um, might be the first to be liberated. Uh, not just here in Australia, but, but if we can contribute something uh, to our, um, you know, into the, into the international ecosystem must have an idea in mind. Uh, well, the way I kind of see it is that we're going to provide the infrastructure. Now, it's, it's very exciting and, and it's great to see that we're building things and we're delivering a product that's going to be you know, commercially usable on the global scale. But ultimately, I see us as just the infrastructure. We're almost the internet for Earth observation. So it's not going to be what we do with the data that's going to unlock the, the solution to the problems we don't even know we have. It's going to be someone further down the value chain and mm. you know I, you know would, would who could have imagined that you'd have Google back when the internet was established so mm. you know, wh where will it go it's pretty hard to say but I think with such a powerful data set and, and there are some some great use cases that we've seen from other data sets overseas where they've adapted um, you know one of the most interesting ones I read about recently was uh, there was a company that used some algorithms that NASA used to detect water uh, on Mars from orbit and they applied that uh, that process of that algorithm to a data set um, from a synthetic aperture radar satellite to detect water leaks in, in water pipelines and monitor that critical infrastructure. And I just found that so captivating and, and, and kind of an application of those, those, those very academic and very science-based kind of missions to then a very relevant commercial world and deliver that value. So you know, those are the things that, that inspire me and I hope inspire other people to, to come up with even better ideas. Yeah, one of the one of the questions I had asked everybody on the panel, maybe you didn't get the message, but what, what was your favorite, the, the favorite Earth observation application that you've heard of recently? So Michael's just shared his. Do others have anything that pops to mind at the moment? <laughs> there is this company in uh, Australia called Arlula. So you can just Google them, and they out a picture of me now from uh, uh, Observation, as observation said, uh, is uh, around the earth, and there are plenty of people. So you have the choice. You have a not great resolution for free, and then if you want to pay, you have a better thing. Is it useful or not? I don't know, but that's one of the applications that again you wouldn't have thought of, of having a, a year ago. Mm. Did you have one, Alex? 
I have a really geeky one. If well, well right? why not? This is very nerdy. We're, we're sort really of in a exciting. nerdy industry yeah, in, 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 at some <laughs> respects. <laughs> if it's okay. Look, there is a really, really interesting application using uh, GPS reflectometry. Mm. I don't know. People using it not just for GPS and positioning, mm. but for instance, the Bureau of Meteorology uses it to look at the profiles of uh, humidity for their mm. uh, climate modeling. But um, some colleagues from NASA and the university in the US is, is now also using that to detect the presence of microplastics and plastics on the ocean. Wow. And that's because the presence of oil slicks and plastics change the micro ripples on the surface of the ocean enough that you can use technologies like this and radar to identify those patches. Mm. And that's becoming a really, really popular application now. Again, geeky, but potentially really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about infrastructure and so the, the, the things that we need to make this work. Just a question for you, Aud, in, in the early phases from what you know now, do you have a sense of how much data needs to be downlinked from these, um, these satellites? So hyperspectral is huge. They're yeah. they requiring lots of amount of data. And that brings me to um, another thought, listening to you, Michael. Without comms, everything we do in space is just a piece of tin yeah, in absolutely. orbit with absolutely no value whatsoever. And so every time you talk about the space mission, there is always comms behind mm. it. And, and when you're thinking of any Earth observation, comms is, is going to be absolutely uh, important. Both ground station and we're looking to optical ground station as well. That's that. Um, so not only comms, but also onboard processing. You need to make sure that okay, this is not the band I wanted to take a picture of. So let's next visit or all on the spot mm. that change band. Um, so I, hyperspectral is, is, is huge. So we have to make sure that we are, we download what is useful or we process on board mm -hmm. what we need to download. And do you anticipate setting up Earth stations as part of this project or we use existing ones or? It, yeah, it is part of this project as well. And, and the communication roadmap as well. And ground station in Australia has a huge potential of as course. well. N not only for our own need, but almost every week you have a, a, a NOAA or, or NASA or ESA calling us to say, can we can we use one of your uh, ground station? Uh, can we can we put a new ground station? And we're doing that in collaboration. I mean, you know that today or tomorrow, tomorrow Thursday, uh, the NNO3 new Norcia uh, antenna uh, that ESA is is uh, they're breaking ground ground tomorrow, and we will um, participate in analyzing analyzing the data. So yeah, ground ground station is. Is paramount to anything you do. And if I could go to Michael next on that. I mean, what are you seeing? I mean, obviously, this is your comms, is your game in a way. Um, there's been a, um, a lot of talk about bottlenecks in, in bringing down data, just as, and as we go to larger and larger sensors with, with larger and larger data sets, what are the issues in actually getting that data back onto the ground uh, so that it can be processed? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. As the, the satellites get that larger, the capabilities get greater, the data sets get, get bigger and, you know, do we need to bring it all down to the ground station all at once? I mean, there has to be a limit put on that. So edge computing, I think, is going to come and play a, a big role, particularly on the space part, but then also we need to make sure that the ground station receives, you know, the data set that we need and then it gets it out to, you know, to, to the cloud, whether that be a private cloud or whether that be an AWS style model. Um, we often put our ground stations where the, the best access to spectrum or the, the optimum weather to enable us to have high availability to the data, to the satellites while they're overhead. But those places are often not located very well for other infrastructure like your fibres and your data centres and things like that. So we need to consider not only the satellite ground stations, but the ground segment to include that, that kind of that backhaul component. And, and that's you know, fibre, it's power, it's data centre access um, as part of the whole mission otherwise any one of those areas has the bottleneck we're not going to be able to get you know you get those, those petabytes through to, to the exactly. people who can use them and Alex I know CSRO has got a long track record yeah. in, in ground stations um, um, what do you see uh, in this context in terms of what yeah. CSRO offers in this I think data relay opportunity I think there is potentially something we can do in Australia as well so we can we can we can uplink the data from our satellites initially to a data relay that gets then forwarded afterwards. Maybe in the future, I think the best place to have a, a another ground station is in Antarctica, right? Because 
but we need the link back. Yeah, how would you yeah, put well, it We've got back? some really <laughs> clever ideas on how we might be able Small to do that. Small details. Other, so but, we um, talk. That's where you see all the passes. Yeah, very quickly, right? So it's like Europe. You have these ground stations all in in in, in Svalbard, in northern mm -hmm. Sweden, in Norway, and it would potentially be a great opportunity for Australia to step up. So a trip to Macquarie south. Island is in order, huh? or further, <laughs> or further <laughs> south. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And what about some of the, um, you know, CSIRO spun out um, the quasar, the quasar. Uh, system. Do you know enough about that? Would that be effective for this? We think it will. Uh, it's initially, I guess, for us uh, astronomy applications, but the, the expectation is that it it will be able to talk and downlink data from multiple satellites all at the same time. Um, that's as far as I understand the technology, but mm. that's uh, this new company that's just uh, ramping up uh, yeah. that will build these, these new antennas. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. The way we use satellite ground stations for, for you know a single satellite on a single pass is very inefficient. Yeah. And um, you know the, the quasar approach to, to being able to receive multiple satellites simultaneously is is very very smart, and it effectively uses you know our resources, our, our position in the world to to much better um, effect. Mm. No, that's a it's a good point, and it, it's the holy grail in comms, right? It having, would be uh, yeah. having an antenna that can do any orbit, any frequency without moving parts. That's the holy grail, right? Yeah, no, that's ideal. So what do we do with all this data once it comes down? Do we have the processing power to actually address these images? Um, is that part of the project as well, Claude? Um, a database to store this, a, a, and, and then obviously a data retrieval thing so that researchers all over can, can work on it. So that's another focus segment of the roadmap, the data enhancement and management, because during the bushfire, we received a lot of um, images for free from commercial um, companies as well, and we had nowhere to store them, uh, nowhere to anal analyze them, no processing power to actually deliver and make something useful uh, with them in, in, in real time. Uh, so yeah, that's a very, very big problem. Now everything is moving to the cloud. We've also invested into uh, the POSE data center in, uh, in, in Perth, and, and we are trying new algorithm um, with this NNO3 antenna from ESA, receiving lots of data and trying to develop new ways to, uh, to analyze and, um, and infuse and providing um, the right information from, from this. But you're absolutely right, the information received is so big that um, the processing power and the algorithm that you need to process the data, but also to deliver it to the end user is, uh, is something that um, is captured in, uh, in the roadmap. And I noticed when you spoke earlier, you talked about GA as having the lead on that, that side of it, the storage. And, uh, and potentially the processing. I'm, I'm sure CSIRO might be involved as well. So um, can you say more about GA or Alex, do you want to cover it? Well, G GA and uh, CSIRO and NCI probably four years ago developed this techno well, technology called the Open Data Cube technology, mm -hmm. which yep. now forms part of Digital Earth Australia, which uh, GA operates now for a lot of applications, which hosts these massive amounts of data and then allows you to process it online. Um, and the expectation is that we will allow, w with these large data hubs, that sort of infrastructure, be it Open Data Cube or Google Cloud or other analytics techniques and platforms to then access those data sets for free and use them. Um, I think what's, is, as Odd was saying, a lot of it is now moving on to the cloud. So even the big data providers from the European or US space agency they're now putting all their data and historical data to the cloud. So there's gonna be quite a bit of interesting discussions to be had about sovereignty of that data, um, about how to protect it, and how to make it available to, to people, uh, but give governments the confidence it's being looked after. That's important. The, the other thing I'd like to add, I'm a great believer in competition and challenges, um, and Australia is running quite a, a few of those. You know, you've heard about the gravity challenge, making all this data available and saying, okay, let's try to find something, and every, every three months, it's a different topic. Um, bushfires or pollutions, or um, and that that is, I think, the best way to, to innovate. We have all this data available again for free, and doing challenges where everybody can, can uh, contribute and, and participate is a great way to innovate and, and see how we can accelerate this. Fantastic. 
Um, we've had a lot of talk today about the need for, or the scarcity of appropriate resources, uh, workforce to actually um, not, well, it generally we've been talking about coming into the space sector. Um, but as we talk, clearly there are different uh, subsectors within the space sector, one of which is Earth observation. Where does Earth observation fit in terms of um, uh, the sexy rating in terms of the, you know, the, the, the key space agency, um, sorry, space sector uh, activities. Um, is there additional work that's needed to draw someone into, say, an Earth observation field within space as opposed to comms or defense or, uh, some, or launch? Um, well, I, I'm happy to start because I'm going to be very biased. I'm a space system engineer. I'm very proud to be a space system engineer. It was bloody hard to study that and to get a graduation uh, uh, for this. And I think in my team, we are all space system engineers. If you want to be able to do this roadmap, if you want to be able to scope a mission like the National Space Mission, you, in, you need to have this end-to-end -end understanding of what it is required. Mm -hmm. You need to know how much it's going to cost. Uh, you need to be able to write the RFQ that we're going to publish at some point. We need to be able to assess the answers and be able to say, this, yes, this is feasible, or no, this is not feasible. So we are not experts in any field. Also, with the time, we become experts in a few in a few areas. But this space system engineering for me is something that space will always need, because you need to have this, this vision. Then you can ask experts. Like, I'm not a new expert, and, and for all the hyperspectral data, I go and see Alex or, or, or others. But I think, especially in agencies, and when I talk with ISA, where I started my career, or, or CNES, where I also work, you can see that they are really, it's really clear that you still need this kind of, um, uh, of um, background in space agency if you, want, if you want to be able to design good programs. Um, so that, uh, we will always need that. Then there is a lot of pockets everywhere else. Absolutely. So that we will always Couldn't need. Couldn't agree more. So that's one part of this story, the space engineers. Mm. Um, I guess System. I would... <laughs> space systems engineers, uh, they get it right. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, my part of this, the other side of that coin is the data and the data science. Uh, and those people who we can try to um, excite with projects like AquaWatch, which really reach into community um, and maybe, maybe get uh, kids excited to study geography, uh, geospatial analytics, cloud computing. In fact, the biggest problem we have at the moment is to attract com cloud computing architects, experts, because mm -hmm. us in the public service cannot pay their salaries anymore. Mm -hmm. So how do we make them still want to work with us or, or in, in, the, in the government? It's really, really hard. So um, that's one area. Um, in terms of ground infrastructure that we want to set up uh, as well, these calibration sites, we will need a lot of trades and, and experts that will help us maintain those bits of infrastructure all around the country. Um, and that goes all the way down to TAFE and, and training at that level. Um, so it's not, not necessarily PhDs and engineers we need, but we need a huge range of um, expertise in electronics, in data management and things like that, mm. all the way down um, to, of course, high school in TAFE. And procurement people as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And, le and legal people. <laughs> and legal. And marketing and business people. Yeah. Did you have a comment, Mike? Yeah. So, from an Australian SME's perspective, uh, the establishment of the space agency and the roadmap, and, and you know, using things like calling it the National Space Mission is, is great for us because it allows you to see the outputs of, of what you're working on and what you're building on. So, you know, for me and for my team to be working on programs where you can see the output and Earth observation is a, is a very visual um, application, it, it gives you a sense of purpose. That helps to attract people and that's, you know, that's what people get up for every morning. So, you know, it's the direction that we're getting and, and that is really encouraging you know, how we make our decisions where we make our investments and and attract more people in. You know, I've heard so many times in the last couple of days how hard it is to attract people into the industry. Um, 
but we need to step up and inspire them to come and be a part of it. You know, to make sure that your job's not just this little bit here. You're contributing to something that's greater than the sum of its parts. So Matt, do you see, where do you see attracting people into earth observation within your, within Talus, as opposed to other, other sectors of space? <clears throat> just before I uh, touch on that one, uh, listening to the discussion about the uh, huge amounts of data associated with the hyperspectral uh, sensors and so forth, it sounds, sounds like a perfect opportunity to deploy a neuromorphic sensor they've built uh, <laughs> and, uh, and take advantage of some of the narrowband uh, uh, mm. uh, capabilities of, of that. Um, but I think we've had a lot of discussion over the last couple of days about how, um, mm. how uh, as an industry, we're really struggling to mm. um, attract not just for Earth observation, but just generally into, yeah. um, uh, into the business of space. And of course, the, the uh, space agency government have, uh, have set a target of 20,000 new jobs by mm. 2030. So what, you know, there's not a lot of time left. Mm. Um, I saw Ord's slide. Um, uh, 1.2 billion was going to generate, was it 500 new jobs? So there's 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 a lot more money to be spent to get from 500 <laughs> to 20,000. Uh, mm. So uh, yeah, I, um, it's yeah it's an ongoing challenge. Obviously, yeah. mind you, it's not a new challenge. Either. Correct. One of the things um, I was thinking of when uh, one of the other panels was um, uh, talking about uh, how do we uh, attract uh, talent to the industry, uh, you know been on the um, you know, satellite working groups in, in various guises for, for mm. over 10 years and that's been on the agenda, mm. you know, uh, diversity it's and It's got more urgency now. Uh, it has <laughs> because, well, I think the reason it failed the first time, if, if, if you go back 10 years, was because there wasn't really any industry pull through. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there weren't these sort of programs that Lord's talking about. There weren't, um, you know, the, the, the nation building programs that the, the government is now um, uh, investing in, uh, but this time there is, mm. and so um, surely that should help uh, with, with with pulling that through. But um, as the other panelists have said, you know, it really starts way down the education system. Um, our outgoing CEO, a CEO, would would say, you know, we need to make maths mandatory. Is his um, mantra mm. uh, because there seems to be statistically, you know, a, a very flat line, if not declining, um, you know, STEM. Uh, participation. Uh, people uh, are not attracted to that um, for all sorts of reasons. You know, uh, it's not a simplistic analysis. But um, but yeah, I think um, one of the exciting things about this is because with Earth observation data, the the imagination is sort of limitless, isn't it, as to what you can do with it, and especially when you combine it with um, with data coming out of a whole Earth observation ecosystem, not just. Um, what Australia will be able to contribute, then, then really there's going to be you know, potential for lots of killer apps to emerge mm. through that process. So I think that should uh, well and truly help um, get a, a younger and, and a more diverse generation of people up through and into um, you know, the space, the business of space, including Earth observation. Well, we have to start somewhere, and unfortunately we're out of time, but it, you just pinged in my head initially Earth observation.